What's good, everyone? Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I am your host, Anthony Benitez the Third. Okay, I made the last part up. It's just Anthony Benitez. <laughs> What's going on, everyone? Listen, I am super, super excited. Today's going to be another marvelous episode. We are going to be exalting, talking about the wonderful person of Jesus and his finished work. Now, I want to touch on something that the Lord has been showing me. And I really want you guys to ask for wisdom. We know, let's just do that right now. Let's pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus right now. Father, I ask you as we endeavor as we dive into your word open our eyes and give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of jesus help us to see the finished work of your son open our eyes and flood them with light thank you in jesus name amen so why did i pray that because that's a prayer found in ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 16 17 18 and verse 19 Actually, verse 20, 21, and 22. So, from Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 22, Paul, by the Spirit of God, prays for the Ephesian, Ephesian church. Now, any Bible teacher will tell you, the Ephesian church, they were the most mature. They were the most uh, spiritually, you know, uh, they moved past teenage years in the Spirit, and they were chewing meat. They were the most mature church. Any Bible teacher would tell you, well, what will, let's say you had Paul in the flesh, right? Let's say Paul in the flesh is here now in LA, 2024, right here in uh, Bel, Bel Air Glen. What is he going to pray for me for? What, what would he desire for me? Not only for me, but for you. Let's say if Paul in the flesh was here, what, what would he pray for you for? Well, Anthony, you know what's going on. I, I've been having these battles in my mind, okay? Well, Anthony, you don't understand. I've been having these uh, sicknesses. I have this pain in my body. Okay, that's valid. You don't understand. My, my teenagers, they're just out, you know, on the Sunset Strip at the Roxy every single night. Okay, the Roxy is great, but okay, that's a great concern. Um, what's going on? So all these, all these concerns, they're valid. They're real. You know, Christian science is like the, that's where the matrix was derived from, Christian science. It's neither Christian and it's not even science. But Christian science says, you know, deny the reality. So I'm not saying to deny. That's not faith. That's just um, unintelligence. It's not, it's, not, it's not intelligent. I don't even think that's a word, but I just made it up right now. So we don't deny what's in front of us. We don't deny the mountain that we see. We don't deny the emotions. We don't deny the teenage son that is, you know, on, on whatever it is. We don't deny the pain in our body. We don't deny that there's, you know, maybe a conflict within our mind. We do not deny these things. However, when we ask the Lord for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, when we ask him to open our eyes, to flood them with light, to open our eyes to see his son, his finished work, something happens. Why? Paul did not pray for the Ephesian church to uh, be delivered from oppression, from poverty, from sickness, from disease. And I would beg to even ask you this question. Where do we see Paul praying for churches, like uh, established churches, for them to be, uh, to be healed from their sicknesses and diseases? You know, it's something that we move past as you grow in the Lord. So with that being said, if Paul in the flesh was here in L.A. 2024, or let's say you're located in Amsterdam, maybe he's there with you right now. What would he what would he pray for you? Would he pray for deliverance of all these problems that I brought up, you know, oppression, uh, healing, things like that? All these things are valid. They are valid. They are real. But Paul, the apostle, by the spirit of God which is meant for you and I as well. He didn't pray for deliverance. He didn't pray for healing. He didn't pray, you know, for uh, generational curses, which don't exist as a Christian, to be broken off of you. He didn't pray for, you know, your neighborhood witch to stop, um, you know, using sage. I use sage, but to cook. 
you know, he, he didn't pray for any of these like little um, miscellaneous things. The biggest thing that he prayed, and, I, and this is something that I've been praying and I will continue to pray. This is something that even um, Pastor Prince, whom I follow very, very closely, this is the prayer he said he prays over himself the most. So I am, I am exhorting this to you from the onset of this broadcast is that we pray not for deliverance. We pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of his son. Why? Because the truth of the matter is, now listen to this statement, if we are oppressed, we are simply oppressed in our beliefs. There was a man of God um, who said something maybe two years ago that really stuck to me. You know, when I first, when the Lord first saved me, I went through this whole her like heretical uh, cult in Christianity about believing Christians can have demons and generational curses. And then, praise God, he brought me a minister. And that is that is why, you know, a lot of times we pray for the Lord to have, like, open visions, and we, we want the spectacular and the fireworks. But the Lord Jesus is talking to you right now. And it, it, it takes humility to humble yourself to listen to this dude from Los Angeles that stutters at times, that, you know, doesn't say the things that you want to hear perfectly. This is the way that the Lord has ordained it. Why? Because it takes humility. So when I was in that Christian, you know, cult, it was not even a Christian, it's not even Christian, and they were teaching about demons and generational uh, generational curses, the Lord brought this man, th this this great minister, and he was he did like a three hour seminar on spiritual warfare and deliverance. But he said this one statement that I want to focus on right now. He said, "No Christian can be oppressed," which is completely contrary to what we believe in, right? But he said, "No Christian can be oppressed; they can only be deceived." And then Pastor Prince, that, that's where I got this statement from, where he said. If we are oppressed as Christians, we are simply oppressed in our beliefs. Today's going to be a mature topic, so I, that's why I pray. That's what the Lord, I, I didn't even think about praying in the beginning, but I, now I know why the Lord did what he did in the beginning. Today's going to be a deep topic, and it's going to take spiritual intelligence and understanding to hear what I'm saying. So no Christian can be oppressed. No Christian, no, no Christian can be bound. Well, Anthony, I don't understand because I see I, I, I see things in my life that I don't like. Again, those are valid. However, listen to what I'm saying and I'm going to continue to elaborate in the minutes to come. A Christian cannot be oppressed. A Christian can be deceived. Because the truth of the matter is that, that we are already free. We are seated in heavenly places. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, right after that prayer, far above every power, principality, name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. And he has put all things under Jesus' feet. And he has made Jesus the head for the benefit of the church. So if we are in him, that means that we are seated, we are enthroned. We're, we are in the upper room. We are seated in heavenly places, far above every power, principality, addiction, oppression, anxiety, fear, poverty, all these things. We are seated because it's a position of rest, far above all these things. And because we are in Christ, we have been made a king, a priest. We are a new creation in Christ. All things have become new. So the new creation, the new creature in Christ, the new creation is free from sickness and disease, is free from mental torment. Why? Because the Bible says, but we have the mind of Christ. So this is called elevating our thinking. This is called holy thinking. You know, when we, when we talk about holy thinking and unholy thinking, you know, people think, oh, if I say unholy thinking, you're thinking about naked bodies. 
which it is to an extent, but it's, it's much more than that. And when we talk about holy thinking, oh, you know, he's thinking about praying. He's thinking about fasting. You know, he's thinking about giving to the poor. It, unbelievers, today when I went to the gym, I always see like unbelievers like going out of their way to open the door for old people. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Just get what I'm saying though. But you have to understand, there's a lot of people that are that ha that have rejected the Lord Jesus that love to give to charities, that love to to clean, you know, adopt the highway, that love to give to charities for you know on a monthly basis. They they fast more. If you wanna, if you if you want to realize something, that the Muslims, which uh, I've I've had a lot of Muslim friends, they're great people. They actually are way more devoted than many, many Christians. They fast more. They pray more. They uh, they don't skip Lent or whatever it is that's going on. They, they're they very devoted people. They're very like family-oriented people. So why am I saying all these things? Because it, it's, it's, we think that holy thinking is thinking about giving to the poor. We think that holy thinking is about praying and fasting and consecrating yourself. That, that's when in reality, many unbelievers are obsessed even with that notion. Why? Because it's like it, it, it's trying to work to soothe your conscience. But holy thinking is what I'm talking about. Holy thinking is, is you and I realizing that we died with Christ, that we were buried with Christ, that we were resurrected with Christ, but we resurrected as a new creation, that when, when the Lord himself ascended we ascended with him in him when god sat when god said you are my son you are my son you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and and made him sit down next to him he made us sit down in christ as well so the way that we're going to be talking about for the next 30 minutes is we're going to be talking about holy thinking we're going to be we're going to be elevating our thinking understanding the new person in christ your position in Christ, your identity in Christ, and the new creation in Christ cannot be oppressed. I will tell you even this, the new creation in Christ is superior to Satan and every single cohort in this world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The new creation in Christ is far above every power and principality. The new creation in Christ, the Bible says, we have the mind of Christ. The new creation in Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, that the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and his church. So your body is one flesh with the Lord Jesus. His body is full of youthfulness. It doesn't age. So our bodies don't age. His body is glorified his body does it not receive sickness and disease we don't receive sickness and disease his body is healthy strong youthful the bible says of jesus that he is the dew of god's youth and if he is the dew of god's youth first john says as he is so are we in this world then that means you and i we are the dew of god's youth so in the same exact manner this new creation in Christ, it, he or she, it's a whole different teaching, but the new creation in Christ cannot be oppressed. However, we can be lied to, and deception is very strong. I, 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 would, I will agree to that. So any, you and I, whenever we feel oppressed, whenever we feel um, bombarded with a lot of you know, turmoil, and I'm not even disregarding any of this because I'm telling you, I deal with so much of this. And the Lord is helping me. And this is the reason why I came on to talk about this because this is how He has been helping me is to elevate my thinking. I'll give you an example because far too many times, you know, I, I say this time and time again. I will always glory in my weaknesses. My mind is 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 my greatest weakness. It's my greatest weakness. And through this mind, the Lord has unveiled a lot of wonderful truths that have blessed a lot of people. But because His grace flows in my weakness. So my mind is my greatest weakness. I will, I will boast that forever. So because of that, a lot of times I would find myself striving to get deliverance for my mind. To get deliverance from depression, anxiety, any type of emotional torment. I would strive or fight to get deliverance. 
and it, it would honestly it would only get worse because I'd, I'd become so obsessed with it then i would be listening to sermons about the battle for the mind six hours a day and it made it worse because i was so obsessed with it you know when when, when a person you ever talk to someone who's physically sick i have and the minute that you see them, it's like all they do is talk about their sickness. All they do is talk about their disease. All they do is talk about their, you know, disability. Is there something, you know, I'm not bashing that, but I'm saying that that's a tendency of the flesh. Is that if you look at a whiteboard and it's completely clean and you see one speck of a black mark at the very corner of the whiteboard, our natural eye will look for the blemish, will look for the spot. Though the entire whiteboard is clean, we will be drawn to the imperfection. That's that's the tendency of the flesh. So I would be obsessed thinking about, you know, my mind, my mind, my mind, but battle for my mind, you know, praying about it. I would pray, I would pray, I would fast, I would read books about the mind, I would be listening to sermons about the mind, and it just got worse. And the Lord showed me is because I was fighting something that is already dead, and that's called unbelief. You see, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, reckon yourself dead indeed to sin. So every single, and again, this is, this, this is uh, I'm attempting to unveil a spiritual reality. So bear with me as I try to, not try, but you, you get what I'm saying, friend. So bear with me as I try to unveil invisible realities with natural words. So we're dead to sin. So if you go to the cemetery, I've used, this, I've used this example in the past and it's great. If you go to a cemetery and there's a dead body inside one of those tombstones, go to the cemetery and begin to tempt the person who is in the grave. Begin to tempt them with the law. Say, hey, don't you realize it's January 1st? You need to be fasting for 21 days dead person why aren't you fasting you know god's not god god doesn't love you if you're not fast all this her, you know heretical stuff so you can tempt them with the law you can tempt them with you know with outright sin you can tempt them with drugs you can tempt them like hey you want to go you know just you want to go down to las vegas and just you know get drunk out of our faces and you know go to the strip club all this stuff you can be Tempting, you can be telling that to the dead person inside that tomb, inside that uh, that tombstone, underneath the ground, and I will ask you this question: While you're trying to tempt this dead person, what is the dead person's response? You would hear, you would hear crickets. Why? Because the person is dead. So if you and I, if we go there and we're like, yeah, you know what, let's cause this dead person to sin, to start, you know, working for his salvation. And we go there and we, and we, you know, try to maliciously tempt this dead person to do all these things. What will the dead person's response be? Nothing, because the person is dead. Then the Bible tells us explicitly, therefore reckon yourself dead indeed to sin. So what was happening was that anxiety is sin. So when I was, instead of being unresponsive, because that's what a dead person is, he's unresponsive. The EMT or the paramedic, if this person stops breathing, they would call their operator and say, this person is unresponsive. He's dead. So the Bible says, reckon yourself dead indeed to sin. So, what, what was happening was I would feel these emotions and these emotions are not, were not even real. These emotions, I mean, they were real, but they weren't, they were a lie. The Bible calls the devil the father of lies. So these emotions would come in and they're, they're all lying emotions. So I would bite the bait and begin to strive and fight internally against this sin, which is called anxiety. So in fighting this sin, 
I was not bearing witness to the truth. Because the truth is that we are dead to sin. The truth is that the old man, the old creation, yes, he was probably cursed with anxiety. I agree. The old person, the old man, the old creation in Adam, yes, that person was cursed with anxiety. I agree. But that person is dead. So what was happening was whenever I would feel these lying emotions, then I would fight them internally. I'd become obsessed with them. I would give weight to them. I will become focused on them. And whatever you focus on, you empower. So by I would even pray against them. And by praying against it, I'm actually bearing witness to a lie. I was in unbelief. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we are dead to that sin. And every other sin, just personalize it for yourself. We're dead to sin. So whenever we fight internally against anything that is dead, we are lying in essence. We are, tr we are bearing witness to a lie. And the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth cannot bear witness with a lie. We not, we not might be intentionally lying, but ignorantly we're lying. We're not, we're, not, uh, we're not bearing witness to the truth. The truth is that we're dead to sin. So remember that illustration about the dude in the cemetery? So when those things arise, what do you do? What is your response? Your response is to be unresponsive because that is what a dead person is. I'll give you another example. I have a very cute husky. He's like a model dog. He's amazing. He's beautiful. And one day... He was just laying down in my living room. I went to get water. I came back upstairs. And as I'm walking upstairs, I'm just looking at him because he's so adorable. He's so handsome. So then I'm like calling him like, hey, Nico, Nico, Nico. And he like looks at me without even moving his body. And he looks away because he was taking a nap and I was disturbing him. He looked up and looked away and just closed his eyes and went back to sleep. He didn't even flinch. He didn't even move. He just like, his eyes are open. He looked at me and, he's, and like, like a... Like a mean girl look, like what? And he closed his eyes and he looked away. And the Lord said, that is the same exact reaction you should be having when these lying emotions come to you. Because we're dead to these sins. We're dead to the old nature. We're dead to sin. So, Whenever we fight internally against all these things, like I'm saying, we're not bearing witness to the truth. The truth is that the new creation cannot be oppressed, but the new creation can be lied to, can be deceived. And if we are in oppression, if we are oppressed, if we are bound, we are only bound by something that we are believing wrongly about. That means we're believing a lie. If we have anxiety, fear, turmoil, oppression within our lives, that means we're believing a lie. There is something that, that we're believing. We're believing our emotions. We're believing what we see. We're believing the mental programming of the old habits. We're believing a lie. And that is the fight of faith. Because we have to realize that on this side of heaven, everything is by faith. Everything is either faith or unbelief. And when we go against the truth ignorantly by fighting against these things that we are dead to we are in unbelief and unbelief produces the entirety of the work of the flesh so this is the deeper root it's not about you trying to get free because if you try to get free you're actually saying i am not a free person but the bible says he whom the sun sets free is free indeed and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he is, present tense, a new creation. Now listen to this. Old things have passed away. Behold. That means look, look and see. All things have become new. And that means all things have become new. Everything has become new. Not just your spirit, everything has become new. You have a new mind. Your body is the is one with the body of Christ. The Bible says the two shall be one flesh. So your body is one flesh with Jesus. 
Your mind is one mind with Jesus. Your spirit is one spirit with Jesus. You are a new creation. Everything on this side of heaven, however, is reckoned by faith. So you can be saying, no, I don't believe that, Anthony. I don't believe my body is one flesh with him. Then according to your faith, so be it unto you. But this is the truth nonetheless. So when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're talking about the truth versus a lie. Deception versus the truth. Unbelief versus faith. If you're an unbelief, that means we're not believing the truth. That's what unbelief is, is unbelief. Belief is not believing the truth. And the truth is that we are free. The Bible says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Free from the law, right? But also the Bible says we are dead to sin. So the Bible says we are free from the law. We are dead to the law. That's great. That's amazing. Furthermore, the Bible says we are dead to sin. And sin is not just a, you know... Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sin is depression. Sin is anxiety. Sin is sickness and disease. Sin is poverty. Anything that sin is is missing the mark. So all these things. Why am I talking about these things? Because all these things we're dead to them. We're, we're dead to a broken marriage. We're dead to uh, restless nights. We're dead to all these things. And this is the truth. And and when we believe the truth then we act as if. We act as if, not because it's not so, but we act as if. Why? Because it is so. That's faith. So, to walk by faith is walking according to the truth. So, if we are fighting a dead sin, that means we're not walking according to the truth. If we're fighting... A battle, the battle has been finished. So when we fight a battle, that means that we are believing it's not finished. You, st do you see how subtle this is? Do you, like I, I pray that the Lord's opening your eyes to this stuff. I'm going to give you this amazing revelation that the Lord helped me with. It's found in Isaiah 61 and it's found in, in Luke as well. It's very famous. It's Jesus speaking. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Right? Remember that? Now I want to focus on this. The Bible says, I've come to open the prison doors to those who are bound. If you look in if you look in Isaiah 61, where that is pulled from, you read the Hebrew where it says to proclaim the opening of prison doors to those who are bound. That Hebrew word is actually to open the eyes to those who are bound. Now, let's pause. Why would the Lord Jesus say, I've come to open the eyes to those who are bound? Because you and I are no longer bound. But we just can't see it sometimes. We are actually free. We are a new creation in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are not under the law, we're under grace. We have one flesh with the Lord Jesus. Our body, I know this is hard to believe, but this is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5. Our body is one flesh with Jesus. The Bible says, I speak a great, this is why it's called a great mystery. If, if a mystery is easy to be understood, then it wouldn't be called a mystery, friend. But the Bible says, I, this is a great mystery. For the two shall become one flesh. I speak a great mystery, but this is concerning Christ and his church, you and I. So we are one flesh with Jesus. So our body is one flesh with Jesus. Sickness and disease is actually a punishment for sin. And if you've been hearing us for any amount of time, there is therefore now no more punishment for them that are in Christ. Fear is a punishment for sin. There is therefore now no more punishment to them that are in Christ. Depression, anxiety, every mental health issue that's going on in the world is a punishment for sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no more punishment to them that are in Christ. 
So the new creation is completely free. The new creation is superior to Satan. The new creation cannot be cursed. The new creation is blessed. The new creation cannot be oppressed by any devil, demon, nothing. However, the new creation can believe a lie, which produces bondage. So th this is spiritual warfare because the Bible says uh, the shield of faith will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. We, what is faith? What is faith? We, we've been talking about this for some time. Faith is not some sort of atomic bomb that you muster up out of your own strength to have faith in. Faith, simply put, is to rest. Why are you resting? Because you trust in what the word of God says because of who the person is. So if the word of God says that we are a new creation, that we've been set free, that every punishment has been paid, that we're under grace, that we that all things have become new, that we have a new nature, then to to have faith is to believe the truth. And if you believe the truth, then there is nothing left for you to do but to simply rest. So you bear witness to the truth. Now, out of that position of rest, I agree, there is good works that go, to, go along with it. But, but the, that is a secondary, that's a fruit. But the root, must, you must be established in understanding that everything has been finished of your identity. Because what's going on is that we, we have identity crisis going on. We have an identity crisis going on. Uh, you know, in the beginning of the day, we believe we're a new creation in Christ. And we have a new nature. And the mind of Christ, we believe that we're, we, we've been made rich. And then the second half of the day, because of L.A. traffic, we start looking at our bank account and counting, you know, dollars. And, you know, if I get five G's from this deal today, if I get, you know, another 25,000 this and that and it's like oh, that action right then and there is we're actually believing a lie because if you've been made rich which is what which is what the bible says sorry to startle any religious folks but if you've been made rich which is, which is what the bible says if you've been made a king and a priest question do you ever see a king counting his gold coins like hoarding it no, because everything is his. He, he's a ruler. He's a king. In the same exact manner, the Bible says all things are yours. So, this is spiritual warfare. Is is to believe the truth. Is to realize that we are a new creation in Christ. And because we are a new creation in Christ, the Bible says this. He says, knowing this. In Romans chapter, I believe it's chapter 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with. So the old man, the old nature, which I agree, all of, all, all of our old natures, all of the old atoms, they were cursed with something. They were cursed with addiction. They were cursed with anxiety. They were cursed with poverty. They were cursed with, uh, you know, cousins marrying cousins. It's a thing. They were cursed with all these sensitive topics that we don't, that a lot of people don't want to talk about. You know, um, all these mental stuff. You know, to be remedial, it's it's a it's a curse. It's a generational curse. I, I so the old nature was cursed with all these things, but we are not. In the old man anymore. We are not in the old nature anymore. We are a new creation in Christ. And where is Christ? At the right hand of God, your Father. Seated. And that is where you and I, we are seated in heavenly places. Far above every power and principality. And name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things underneath our feet. Revelation chapter 1 says he has made you a king and a priest by his own blood. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that in the lips of a king is a divine sentence. In other words, what you say will be executed by your servants. That You ever watch like movies with kings? If a king says something, 
They say, okay, king. He says it once. He doesn't have to be there because I've done this multiple times. I, I say it once and I'll say, and I'll start saying it multiple times. And, and then before I know it, I'm in unbelief. But a king says it once and that's it. And then it gets executed. So you've been made a king. You've been made a, a priest. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He who knew no sin became sin. That's talking about Jesus. So that you can become the righteousness of God in Christ. So what I'm doing today is I, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you who you are. I'm like that monkey and lion king taking, taking down the little cup to the water and pointing him to the water and saying, this is who you are. Your father, though he died, but he is alive in you. So I'm the, I'm, I'm the monkey today just pointing to you, pointing at the mirror of the word of God, telling you who you are in Christ, telling you that your old nature has been put away. The old nature that was cursed with all these things. The old nature that, that couldn't do anything right. The old nature that was cursed with calamity, destruction left and right, curses left and right, parking tickets left and right, getting pulled over left and right, car accidents left and right. That is a part of the old nature. And you are not in the old nature. So let everyone around you get parking tickets. Let everyone around you get pulled over. Let everyone around you receive because that's that's their nature. But as for you and I, we have a new nature in Christ. We are born again. We are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So your new nature has been put away. What else? Your mind. The Bible says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. Let's break that down. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, You have not received the spirit of fear or timidity. You're not a timid person. If you're a timid person as a Christian, you're believing a lie. Because the Bible says you have not given, because what was happening? Timothy was a pastor. Timothy was being shy because he was getting persecuted for some of the truths that he was preaching. So Paul, as his father, said, Timothy, you have not received the spirit of fear. Another translation says you have not received the you have not received the spirit of timidity, because why he was shying back, people were persecuting him and he was shying back, he was shrinking back, he was becoming timid. So Paul said, hey 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 Timothy, you have not received the spirit of fear, you have not received the spirit of timidity, but of power, of love and not hatred, and of a sound mind. That means you have a sound mind. I look up the word sound because no one says, well, what's a sound mind? A sound mind means to have, to be in equilibrium, to be in balance. That means you have a clear mind. That means you think straight. That means your emotions are not out of whack, no matter what you feel. That's called faith. You wouldn't need faith if there were circumstances or feelings that were contrary contradictive to what you're believing that's why it's called faith you if you can feel it if you can see it then why would you need faith for it? but if you feel the opposite of what the bible says and if you see the opposite of what the bible says then you do need faith why would you need faith so if so for instance if timothy was just feeling like you know soundness of mind then why would he need faith to believe that he has a sound mind but which i believe because that's what the bible says if he was feeling fearful if he was feeling timid if he was feeling shy then paul said hey you have not received this spirit you don't have a you don't you don't have the spirit of fear or timidity but power love and of a sound mind a sound mind is a healthy mind you have a clear mind you have a a, a sound mind and in Corinthians, the Bible says, you have been given the mind of Christ. And the Bible says in Colossians that Christ is the embodiment of wisdom. That Christ is greater than Solomon. So we boast about Solomon's wisdom, but Christ's, Christ's wisdom is greater than the, than the wisdom of Solomon. And you have been given the mind of Christ. A mind that is sound, a mind that is not full of fear. But I fear fear, Anthony. I get it. Trust me. I get it, especially with this one. This is a soft spot for me. But I'm here to tell you, those feelings are a lie. This is called the fight of faith. This is called spiritual warfare. So you believe the truth, even with the feelings being present. You believe the truth. What else? 
your mind, your nature, your old nature is gone. You have a new nature. Your body. But Anthony, I have this pain. I have this, this sickness in my body. I understand. That is why it's called the walk of faith. We want to see things before they happen. But the in the Old Testament, the priest literally had to have their the soles of their feet touch the water and then the water parted. BC, but what happens is that we want to see the water being parted so then we can have the courage to walk towards the water and walk walk through. But in the Old Testament, the Old Testament priests literally had to have their soles, the soles of their feet touch the water and then imparted. But we want to see the water parted so we can just walk through it. But the soles of your feet must touch the water. That means the 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 emotions of fear were there to have you know what what you know what it means to be courageous to be courageous is not is not to not have fear to be courageous is in the presence of fear you walk through it and you believe so your body though you may feel pain Though you may have received this report from the doctor, I'm here to tell you, sin, the, one of the punishments for sin is sickness and disease. And I want you to look at the cross right now, because that is what happened in the Old Testament with the children of Israel. Fiery serpents represents judgment of sin. Whenever you read about fire, the fire of God, fiery is the judgment of God. Serpents is a type of sin. So fiery serpents, fiery snakes is literally the judgment of sin. So the children of Israel were getting bitten by the judgment of sin and they were dropping dead left and right. But their responsibility was not to look at their sickness or their diseases or the fiery serpent. If you looked at the fiery serpent, you dropped dead. But if you, in the midst of being bit by the fiery serpent, looked to the bronze pole, Look to the bronze serpent on the pole. Now let's pause. Why? What is bronze a type of? Bronze is a type of judgment because it goes through it goes through the fire. In the book of Revelation, when John saw the Lord Jesus, he said his feet were as one who of brass, of metals who have gone through the fire. Why? Because the Lord Jesus took on Every bit of God's judgment for you and I. So his feet, rep representing his entire body, his feet were bronze. Why? Because bronze always, always, always signifies judgment. It signifies a metal going through fire. So the serpent was bronze on the bronze pole, representing that, that's, that, what it, that which is biting you has already been judged on him. That was from the Lord right there. That which is biting you has already been judged on him. So if it's on him, it cannot be on you. So the way to deliverance for the children of Israel, which is a type of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, is when they were getting bit by the fiery serpents, which leads us to, to understand that all these oppressions come upon us. Why? Because we believe we are still under condemnation. Fiery snakes. So what happens is that when they looked at the, fi at the bronze serpent on the bronze pole, they saw that which was biting them judged on the body of Christ already. And they lived it's the same for you and I today. So if, if you have any pain in your body, any sickness in your body, our responsibility, it's a response. You know what a response is? That means something has been done. So our responsibility is to look to the cross and see. I want you to personalize it. Because when I when I receive communion, this is this is one of my prayers, is I take communion, I, I take a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine, and that bread, I look at it, and I say, Jesus, you took this anxiety. You took my sickness. You took my aging. You took my poverty. You took whatever it is. And if you took it, then I don't have it. 
That's the spirit of faith. Faith speaks. So, this is spiritual warfare. So your flesh, though you may feel all these things, I want you to look at that disease on the body of Jesus. And when you take communion, I want you to proclaim that. Jesus, you took this. You took it. I don't have it. But you feel it. But everything's going to scream at you. But you feel it. But the doctor's report, it's okay. I walk by faith and not by sight. I don't deny that it's there. But there's a greater truth. A fact will always be triumphed by a truth. For that which is seen is temporary. The Amplifier says it's subject to change. How? By seeing the cross of Christ. So your body is one flesh with him. Your mind, your old nature, your spirit. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe, uh, gosh, I think 16. Well, no, 1 Corinthians 1, 16, something like that. says, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live inside this body. The Bible says you are one spirit with him. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. And the Bible says that your flesh is one flesh with Jesus, your body. Spirit, soul, body. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all, 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 all things have become new. Spirit, soul, body. But I feel, but I see, but I sense. It's called faith. We want to see the waters parted before we can have the courage to walk towards it. But as you walk towards it and even to the point where the sole of your feet touches the water like the Old Testament priest, then the waters would depart. So I want to end this today with, with, with this. This is our reality. And there's so much more. You have a new nature. Spirit, soul, body is brand new. You're not cursed anymore. You're blessed. You don't have those addictions. You don't have those curses. You don't, All those things are a part of the old man. They're dead in, in the grave. Remember that illustration about the cemetery and the dead body. You think it's funny, but it's, it's actually really helpful. Go and if you don't go, but if it helps you, go ahead. Go and try to tempt a dead person in the grave and see what their response is. Their response should be your response. Why? Because the Bible says you have died Colossians says, indeed, you did die. Colossians chapter 2, I believe, it says, indeed, you did die. <laughs> That's what baptism is all about. Jerry was asking me about baptism. You see, because we, 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 we need visualization. And baptism is a visual aid to help us to see what has already happened in the spirit, which what is already a done reality. So what happens with baptism? You go into the water. That means you're dead. So you let's say if you're let's say you get into the baptismal waters, right? You walk into the waters as the old nature in Adam. So in Adam, it, you're you're addicted to drugs. You're addicted to alcohol. You're addicted to poverty. You're cursed. You're you know your marriages are broken. You're easily divorced. You know catastrophes, car accidents, broken marriages, all this stuff in Adam. So that. That in Adam walks on, walks inside the bathtub, the baptismal waters at the church. The pastor's there. He's holding him. That's a cursed man, cursed woman. So then that cursed woman goes into the grave. And in the grave goes everything that belonged to the old man. Anxiety, depression, addiction, melancholy, self-harm, broken marriages, poverty, sickness, disease, fear, everything. It belonged. Man, I feel the Lord on this. Belonged in Adam, and that in Adam went into the water. The pastor is holding him. I'm giving him visual aid. He goes into the water. In the water falls every single bit of that sin. Then the person gets risen out of water by the pastor, and that person comes out of the water. Not the same. Not not now. Listen. Not the same Adam. Not even a refurbished Adam. Not even a Adam that has been power washed. No. 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 That in Adam, that Adam died and is dead in the grave. And you resurrected in the new Adam, the last Adam, in Christ. And in Christ, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. 
I feel the Lord on this, so I need to settle down a little bit before I start preaching. So you rose from the water, but you didn't you didn't raise a refurbished person, uh, a, a, you know, a better person, quote, quote, unquote. That person could never have gotten better. That person died and you were resurrected from the baptismal water as a new creation in Christ. And you weren't just resurrected, you know, in the first heaven, the Lord himself in him he bore you and he ascended into heaven and you rose with him that's why the bible this is this this is a great revelation i, I pray the lord will help you on this in second corinthians the bible says paul the apostle said i knew a man in christ who was taken up to third heaven are you in christ yes so you are take you have been taken up to third heaven so where are you now So you are a new creation. You are not cursed. You don't have all these things. You you don't even have a tormented mind anymore. But I feel it. I sense it. I know. But that's faith. Those are lying. That's, that's what the Bible calls lying emotions. Lies. Lie. But I feel it. But it's a lie. So what do I do? Nothing. <laughs> Remember, what, what would the dead person in the cemetery do? Do? If let's say this little devil of anxiety walks around, you know, a little short, you know, six inch devil, he goes to the cemetery, his name is anxiety, and the dead person inside the grave is there and anxiety's like talking to the dead person. Indulge me, indulge me, indulge me, indulge me. That dead person, what is his response to this little devil? Nothing. Why? Because he's dead. He's dead. So what is your response to those emotions? Nada. That's called faith. Fight the good fight of faith, friend. So I wanna I want to end here and the the this is something that um we're gonna continue to dive in for the next couple episodes because this is a higher way of of of, of understanding. This is actually the way to victorious living. It's not working or fighting. If you fight, you will fall. Write that down somewhere. If you fight, you will fall. Why? Because the fight is over. So when you're fighting, you're actually in unbelief. Because if the fight is over, let's say you're in a boxing ring. You know, the fight is over. The arena is empty. And you go in there all suited and booted. And you jump inside the ring. And you're like, let's fight. A per the janitor will come by and be like, this guy is on drugs. Why? Because the fight is over. If the fight is over, what are you suited and booted for? That's why the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, Rejoice for your warfare has ended. 39 books in the Old Testament. The 40th book is Matthew in the Bible. Matthew, I understand the New Testament is after the crucifixion of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. But in your Bible... Matthew is the beginning. Matthew is the 40th book from Genesis to Revelation. Matthew is number 40, which is the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 40, it begins with this. Rejoice. Why? Because your warfare has ended. So I'm here to proclaim this over you. In Jesus' name, rejoice. Rejoice. Because your warfare has ended. So, I want to leave you guys with that. And I will see you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you're encouraged by it. If you believe in what we're doing and want to help us continue spreading the word about our gracious and loving Savior, consider supporting our podcast. Your contribution, whether it's a one-time gift or becoming a monthly partner, goes directly towards our media and our video production efforts. Together, we can continue to share the good news to those that need it the most. Visit our website to give today. And thank you for your generosity.